So I'm going to take a brief look at who's funding archaeology PhDs in the UK. Um, I apologize right now, it is going to be death by graph. Um, but there is a lot of data and it is kind of interesting, or at least I find it very interesting. So there's a lot of different things, a lot of different options you can use to try to figure out this information. Um, one source of information on this is HESA, which is the Higher Education Statistics Agency. Uh, started roughly 1992, 1993. Um, it's a semi-private organization that collects um, basically all the statistics on higher education in the UK. So this right here is basically the percentage of funding of different sources for PhDs. Now it gets very complicated. These are PhDs in the sort of humanities side of archaeology. Archaeology um, gets split up into two sort of sections for statistics. One is science and one is the sort of humanity side of archaeology. If you'll excuse me for a moment. So um, one sort of interesting trend, if you look at the red, is basically it used to be you could get a PhD, you could start it, and maybe you could take some time off. You could take a couple of years off. I've known some people that are on year 12 or 15 of their PhD. That ruins your rankings and the various different rankings around the world for universities. They want PhDs in and out in three years. And so you're starting to see a trend where you can no longer stay around uh, for your PhD. You have to pay. Um, it used to be you could probably get sort of a, a leeway. You could take a year off. Now, if you take a year off, you have to pay for that year in most universities. Um, so that's just one trend that's pretty highly highlighted right there. Um, this is sort of archaeological sciences up there. I've combined the two. So that's basically all PhDs um, since about 2002. There's data before that, um, but it's locked in reports and it's not in a database that you can access. Um, so I can't actually pull out this information. Um, but what you'll basically see is about 50% of PhDs are self-funded or funded in ways that the university does not know about. So you might be able to get a scholarship from a small, uh, your local history or heritage or archaeology society. Um, if that's not paid directly to the university, it doesn't go on the records. Um, so probably about half of all PhDs currently are basically self-funded. Um, they might be picking up bits and pieces of money somewhere else, but for the most part, half of PhDs are going to be self-funded. Um, an interesting, and you can sort of see there, again, um, the ability to take a year off and not pay any fees has almost completely disappeared. Um, I would not be surprised if in the next five years it just completely disappears and they no longer track those numbers. Um, you're no longer going to be able to take a year off and not have to pay fees. It's just not happening anymore. British Council, research councils, that's all pretty much stayed the same. Um, so this is sort of the funding here. And this has been you know, the last decade or so. Some trends, it gets a little interesting the further back we go. It also gets a little interesting when you look at the different universities. Um, I am pretty sure University of Oxford does not have 100 plus uh, PhDs. <laughs> <laughs> and they have some weird uh, unknown funding things. I'm pretty sure there's some error in the data. Um, they are listed both under humanities and archaeological sciences. Someone somewhere is not putting it in correctly. And so we end up with this really odd number. Um, but you end up, this is fairly accurate. Uh, one problem with HESA is they round everything to the nearest five. So um, if you were to look at Bangor, apparently everyone who goes to Bangor is self-funded. That's not true. But it's rounded it off. So if only one person has, you know, uh, research council funding, they're not going to be counted. So these numbers are somewhat close, uh, but you can see some universities are majority of the students are self-funded. Others, maybe half of them are. Another source of data is before the REF was the RAE um, and they collected lots of information and not just on publications. They looked at departments, they looked at who was funding, who was getting PhDs, 
Um, this is and where this funding was coming from. Uh, pre-1996, they didn't have any information on self-funding. Um, but you can basically see a trend here of self-funding has gone up during the 1990s. And it sort of lines up pretty much with the other stuff. This data, um, it's the first year, the first year you get a studentship. So people might get scholarships their second year. It might slightly change the numbers. But for the most part, this is what the uh, 1990s looked like. Um, and into the early aughts is basically we're seeing more and more students become self-funded. Uh, and that's just sort of combining the data right there. Um, basically, we've gone from a third of the students being self-funded to almost two thirds. So we're completely changing how we give out money to PhDs, how we fund PhDs in the UK. Um, and there's, there's different things. Research councils have slowly shrunk. They're actually are giving out more um, funding now than they were 10, 15 years ago. It's just that there's so many more PhDs. So many more people undertaking PhDs that that number's actually shrunk. Um, overseas has almost disappeared. Institutes, for some reason, in the early 1990s um, were funding a lot more of their students, and then that's kind of shrunk a little bit. Um, and the central government. The government has basically slowly, bit by bit, um, been taken out of the equation as someone who funds archaeology and archaeology research specifically for PhDs. And I'll get into that detail a little more. Um, so there's this little data set. Uh, UCL, which is basically, um, it, they gave USC, sorry, uh, precursor to HESA. And you can go onto the uh, UK Data Archive and get all this data and spend hours and hours looking through different spreadsheets to figure it all out. Um, lots of fun. But basically, you can go back to about 1972 and you can look at this. And it basically is showing a very similar trend. Um, there's something going on in 1985. I am pretty sure that has to do with they changed how they collected data. And it wasn't some sort of giant uh, change in 1985 where all of a sudden they kicked out everyone who was funding and they had to fund themselves. Um, it, it goes back to sort of normal. But you see a general trend of more and more PhDs. This is going back decades. Have gone from being funded either from government. And the uh, government's actually quite large on this one. If you'll see, they, they, um, they were funding you know, 50, 60 different PhDs in the 1970s, 1980s. And this is what happens when you combine all that data together. Uh, so 30 years of PhD data. Again, uh, I'll go back to right here, 1985. They changed how they collected the data right there. And I am pretty sure people just got put into the self-funded and it slowly takes them a while to figure out how to do it back. I do not think a bunch of people suddenly got kicked out of their funding in 1985. As far as I can tell, nothing like that ever happened. Um, it's just a problem with the data. And so it looks like it suddenly jumps down and suddenly, you know, 60%, 70% of people are self-funded. I actually think this line pretty much goes along here. But you start to see the politics of how funding's happening. So uh, government funding, peaks right before 1980. I wonder what could have happened in that year. <laughs> um, so you're seeing the politics of funding. It used to be very centralized um, and then a certain prime minister gate came in and central government funding collapsed as it were. I don't think it's as bad as this. What's basically happened is you'll actually notice on the sort of blue research councils They've moved the pots of money around. They basically said, central government is bad, government's bad, big government's bad, we should let some other else decide it. So they handed it over to the research councils and the research councils started funding more PhDs. That's basically what's happened. It's all politics. So when you're looking at the funding of UK PhDs, you're looking at national trends. You're looking at the politics that's going on nationwide and that's how we're funding our PhDs. Um, it's not really being decided by people inside of the discipline. It's being decided at, um, I don't know, cabinet level. And they've basically decided that central government should no longer fund uh, PhDs. And you can see it's basically gone from almost a third to barely registrable. 
government can no longer fund PhDs directly. So they just pump all the money over to the research councils. The research councils then divvy it out. And that's what's going on in um, UK archaeology for PhDs. Um, and a lot more institutions are now funding their own students as well. And I think there's some implications for that. Who decides this inside the institutions? Why do institutions get to decide what students they're going to fund and what students they're not going to fund? Um, it's, these, these are the big questions we should be asking. If trends continue, um, and so I actually was hoping that uh, Spencer hadn't reached his goal by the time we got this, I could do a plug, but he actually has reached his goal of uh, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding his PhD. But if trends keep holding, we're almost at 60% of PhDs are self-funded. It's going to keep going up. Um, that's, that's what it looks like to me. It's basically more and more archaeology PhDs are going to be paying their own way whether that be through loans, if you're lucky enough to have family, or if you're taking down two or three jobs. Um, occasionally, one or two PhDs each year are funded via a company, an organization. Um, you know, some of the bigger archaeology organizations may fund someone. But for the most part, we're looking at a world in which basically funding is going to be up to you. If you're interested in doing a PhD, it's not for everyone. Um, even then, even then, we still have an incredible amount of students being funded. We have close to 400 PhDs funded each year. As a lot of archaeologists, where are they going to go? <laughs> <laughs> On average, there's about 15 new permanent positions in UK archaeology in academia per year. And that is a good year. I, I condensed this talk down, but it basically you'll see the numbers of permanent positions stay fairly steady and the number of temporary has just gone up. It's skyrocketing. Um, most new jobs in academia are now temporary. You're now going to be a researcher, you're going to be a postdoc. Uh, possibly teaching, and it's going to be a year contract if you're lucky. Most people will probably be six or eight months. And we have 400 people who are getting paid or paid in some way. Unfortunately, the data I can't tell you, you know, is it paying just their fees? Is it paying all their fees? Is it also paying for their housing? Is it paying for the living? That data is not there. But at least 400 people are receiving a good portion of their fees paid for by someone else. Where again, I'm gonna ask the question, where are they going to go? And then we have 400 other people who are paying for it themselves somehow. Now that could be family, or that could be loans that at some point they will have to pay off. Or that could be people who are doing three jobs at once. And that's not sustainable. We will burn people out that way. Um, so basically, I'll leave you guys with these thoughts. Um, we can have it into the discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much.